Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. I'm excited about tonight's topic because I need it. Um, we're gonna we're gonna title it intentional thinking. The mind, the human mind, is fascinating. It cannot be separated from our faith. In fact, I almost titled this tonight, The Mind of Faith, because your mind is involved in your faith, hugely involved in your faith, which is not a shock to you, because most of you have been raised in the faith message, so you understand that. But all of this is still stirring in me from the things that the Holy Spirit showed me when I decided to start dedicating my mind to God at night. It's just something that I had a lot of things swirling in my head, and one night I said, you know what, Holy Spirit, I dedicate my mind to you. While I'm asleep, I'm asking that you minister to me, that you give me revelation, that we show, you show me things that I need to know. And man, did he wake me up that night. I can't even say he woke me up. You, you know what it's like when you're asleep, but you're having these thoughts. I rested and I slept, but I woke up with revelation. And I, I just can't believe I hadn't thought of that before now. So if you're not doing that at night, I advise you to do it. It's, it's quite fascinating. And I told Rusty when he came home, I said, I need 30 minutes, because I didn't leave here till after four from work. I said, I need 30 minutes to lay still. Of course, he didn't know what I was talking about. But guess what happened in those 30 minutes? First of all, I went to sleep. And I woke myself up snoring three times in those 30 minutes. So I know I went to sleep. It's pretty bad when you wake yourself up snoring. But part of the message, I mean, I already had my notes done before I went home. But there's additional notes because of what happened in that 30 minutes because I was in intentionally thinking on the Word before I went to sleep. I'm telling you, sometimes we just forget the simple things are so powerful. So we want to direct um, our thoughts into intentional thinking. When you look up the word intentional, it means on purpose, deliberately, willfully, and predetermined. And I think that's huge, especially at night, that we predetermine our thoughts. It's, it's important in the daytime, too. If you don't predetermine your thought, your mind goes a lot of places. Some are great, some not so great. But if we don't predetermine our thinking, if we don't direct our thinking in, a, in an area, then our minds can go anywhere, any circumstance, any picture, any noise, any sound wants to take us. And we don't want to be that way. We, we need our mind to be accountable to our spirit man. We need our mind, our thoughts, to be accountable to the Word of God. You might put it that way. That might make more sense to you. I need my thoughts to be accountable, not just running around out there loose. In fact, there's a scripture that says, Gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. I didn't look that one up tonight. But, but that means bring them under control. So that they don't go just anywhere they want to go. Go with me to James chapter 1. We'll start there. I think, I think the mind is probably... Mind and words is one of the most powerful things that the faith movement did for Christianity. Because before, I don't... I mean, people just tried to keep from sinning just out of the flesh, tried to keep their, their willpower, keep from sinning. And they didn't realize that if they would put the Word of God in their mind and they would feed on the Word of God, that that's what would keep them from sinning. And so it's really key to so many things in our lives. James chapter 1, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Verse 21. You can read above later, it's all important. But he says, So get rid of all uncleanness and the rampant outgrowth of wickedness, and in a humble Gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the word which implanted 
and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your soul. This is not talking about spirit salvation here. This is talking about salvation of the soul. This is something that's continual in us. Remember the scripture says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When you became, when you were born again, when you accept Jesus as Lord, your spirit was made new. It's perfect. It's born of God. It comes out of Him. You don't have to work on your spirit. You have to work on your mind. We'll look at a lot of those scriptures tonight. But what we're working on is our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's what makes up our soul. Our mind, our will, and our emotions. And he says, if you're going to do that, if you're going to save your soul, then you need to welcome and receive the word. Let it become implanted. Let it become rooted in your hearts because it's what contains the power to save your soul. The King James Version says, Receive with meekness the engrafted. All of y'all know that one. The engrafted word. You know, the, if you engraft something, it's not what was there. You engraft what you want into it. And he's asking us to take the word and engraft it. Receive it. Accept it into the soul of our hearts, if you will. And then it will grow what will save the soul. It's powerful. The word save there is sozo. It's the verb form of salvation. It means to keep safe, to keep sound, and to rescue. His word has the power to keep our soul safe, sound, and rescued from destruction. That is so good. Because he told us that he didn't give us the spirit of fear. But he gave us the, the spirit of love and of power and a sound mind. How is he going to do that? He gave us his word to save our soul. To protect our soul. To rescue our soul from whatever we thought before. Whatever we had in us before. And whatever might ever approach us again. You know, when I was thinking about, and we'll go to it at, if we have time at the end, but I was thinking about how he told us to guard our hearts. To guard our hearts with all diligence. And not just, I saw it as a guard. And I thought, what is that guard? What is going to guard my soul? What's going to guard my soul is my knowledge of the word. So that when something approaches me, a thought comes to me. It doesn't matter if it comes to me uh, through Catherine. It doesn't matter if it comes to me through one of those stupid medication commercials. I mean, when they start lift, listing off symptoms, sometimes I think, I have every one of those. <laughs> Do you ever have days when you feel, yes, so does every other human in the world. So, you know, whatever thought approaches me. I want it to meet the guard of the word. And that guard of the word will determine if I allow that to be engrafted into my soul or if I reject it. We've let a lot of things in that weren't truth and we've let them become a part of our lives and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Sozo, keep safe, sound, and to rescue our souls. Where we think, where we feel, where we desire. Our souls are being saved by the word. It's a continual process. That's why when you get born again, you don't just hear the word one time. Because your soul is still being worked on. Your mind, your will, and emotions are still being worked on. And a lot of people don't, they quit after they get saved. And then they don't feel saved because they haven't changed how they think. The changing of how we think is the Christian walk. Part of the Christian walk, I should say. Okay, we're not through with James 1. Go to verse 22. That was a side journey. He says, But be ye doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it, 
And being a doer of it, he is like a man who looks carefully at his own natural face in a mirror, for he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. But he who looks carefully into the faultless law, the word, the law of liberty, and is faithful to it, and perseveres in looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he shall be blessed in his doing and his life of obedience. The Word is our mirror. We're supposed to look into it and see who we are. But if we don't continue to look into that Word, into that mirror, we will walk away and forget what it showed us we are. That's so powerful. And it, this scripture tells us to, to pursue it, to persistently keep looking into the Word so we don't forget who He says we are. The mirror doesn't lie. Some mornings I wish it did. Sometimes I show up down here to walk with Tanya. T today I wore a toboggan all the way here just to calm my hair down before I saw her because we come early in the mornings uh, before daylight. And so, you know, there's times I wish the mirror would lie, but the Word will not lie. If you look in the Word and it says you're healed, do not walk away from that mirror and forget who it says you are. If that word says you're a child of God, you're above only, you're not beneath, you're the head and you're not the tail, don't walk away from that mirror because it's telling you the truth. Don't walk away and forget who it says that you are. It shows us who we truly are. It puts the truth in front of us. You know, when the truth is in front of us, it makes us examine ourselves. When, when you stand in front of the mirror in the morning, it makes you examine yourself. I hope it makes you examine yourself. It makes us examine our own perceptions. And we'll either face it, we'll either look in the Word and face it and accept it as truth, or we have to walk away from it. I either have to change because of what I see in the mirror or I have to walk away from it and forget what it said. Those are my only options. I can't keep looking in the mirror of the Word and not change. It forces me to face the truth or to walk away and forget what I heard. We don't want to walk away and forget who we are in Christ. But if we'll look, if we'll keep looking in the mirror of the Word, it has the power. That's not dunamis, by the way. It has the power to save our soul. What a, what a thought. That the Word can make wrong thoughts correctable. No matter how you were raised, if you were raised to think wrong, the Word has the power to change that. If you thought poor, my dad would say, poor, you thought poor? My dad was raised poor. You remember the story. Slept in the fertilized shed, snake skins in the underwear drawer, heat by the light bulb. You know, when he looked in the mirror and he heard the word, he and Charles Caps driving in those turn rows down in England, Arkansas, Charles punched in that eight track. I believe it was an 8-track at the time, and said, there's something I want you to hear. And it was Kenneth E. Hagen. It stuck a mirror in their face that those boys didn't walk away from. And they changed us. They put the mirror in front of us. And you know what? Your life should put the mirror in front of somebody else. Make them face the truth. I love that. Wrong thoughts can be corrected. Damaged thinking can be healed. It is healable. Our thinking, our thoughts, our emotions, our will, it's healable. No matter what's happened to us. This is a big concept for me. 
that our feelings and that our damaged thinking is healable. The Word has the power to save my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions. This, this message is life-saving, life-altering. How we saw ourselves, what we did before, what we said before, was based on what we already had built in us. We were acting out the thoughts we had engrafted. Whether it was right or wrong, how they came to us, they got engrafted. Some of it from childhood, engrafted. And so if we're going to change that, then there's got to be a great renovation that takes place. A lot of pruning. In fact, you can go back and read the scripture about him pruning uh, so that there would be more fruit. And you can see that as your thought life and it becomes a beautiful passage of scripture for you. But Proverbs 23, 7, don't turn there, I'm going to go too fast. But Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And we quote it this way, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if we don't like he, we've got to change what's in our hearts. If I don't like she, I've got to change what's in my heart. Matthew 12, 34, out of God's Word translation, says, Your mouth says what's inside you. King James Version, From the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. What we're thinking is going to come out of us. So if we don't like what's coming out, we've got to start changing what we think. And God gave us the power and the ability. That word power there means the ability. Gave us the power and ability to change that where needed. We stand in front of the mirror. We say that needs to be changed. The word has the power to do it. If we'll receive it with meekness and a humble spirit and say, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter if what they did to me or what they said to me. If I feel that it's right, the mirror is showing me something different. I submit myself to the word. And that gives it the ability and the power to change. If we, don't, if we stand in front of the mirror and we don't change, it just doesn't make sense. If it shows us something, we need to, we need to grab a hold of it. It'll take intentional thinking to change what we've already been thinking. This can't be casual. And sometimes I think we've dealt with our thinking casually. We've, we've like James said, we've, uh, we've listened to the Word. Oh, well, I'm listening to the Word. I'm listening to the Word. Well, he said, if you listen to the Word and you don't change something, you're deceiving, King James Version, you're deceiving yourself. I'm listening to the Word. Listen to the Word. Listen to the Word, but change with the Word. When it shows us something, we have to change it. And I think that sometimes we fall into that trap of, well, I'm listening to the Word. Well, James just blew that out of the water. You've got, you've got to do something with the Word that you've heard. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, which you're going to hear me talk, talk about her a couple of times tonight, she deals a lot with the brain. She's a medical doctor. And she deals a lot with the brain. She's dealt with a lot of brain trauma patients and that sort of thing. And she's tested. She's Christian. So what she's done is she's taken these scriptures from the Word and looked into science and shows us from the science side of things what God was trying to tell us. Fascinating. Some of it is deep. But a lot of it, she makes very easy to understand. So I encourage you to watch her on YouTube, read her books, because it's pretty fascinating. But she said this. She said, what your mind creates, only your mind can take away. So even when you hear the word, and it has the power to save your soul, it won't save your soul until you take it and apply it. Because what your mind has created, only your mind can take it away. Powerful. We have to choose to change our minds. The, the book I've been reading is Switch on Your Brain, which most of you have probably read it before. It's, no, it's not a new one. You can go online. You can look at it. I think you can even read it online, can't you? Uh, maybe even for free. So 
It's just the science of this revelation. That's all it is. And it's just explained out. But you can go to Isaiah 55 and, and get what that book teaches. God says, my thoughts are higher than yours. My ways are higher than yours. If you want to change your outcome, you've got to take the word and let it be engrafted into your soul. That's pretty much what Isaiah 55 preaches. Also in Romans 12, which we're going to turn to. Romans 12. You haven't been here very long if you hadn't heard us teach Romans 12. I'm going to read to you out of the King James Version. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I can't help but go to those words, be not where it says, be not conformed, and hear my mother's voice. <laughs> because she taught this one time. I have it written in my old Bible, and I went back to find it uh, today to see what it said, because I remember that be not. I remember her saying, that is a stop sign. He's saying, be not. He's putting a stop sign in front of you right now, and he's saying, be not. Stop. Stop being conformed. And she said, this is what it meant. She said, it, it means it forbids the continuance of an action that's already in process. It forbids, a stop sign forbids the continuance of an action already in progress. So he's telling us, stop. Quit going the direction you're going. Quit going in that vein of thought. Be not conformed to this world. That word conformed out of Thayer's, it means to conform oneself, one's mind and character to another's pattern. We're to be patterned after one thing. We were made in the image of God. We were made, Genesis is very plain. Man was made in the image and after the likeness of the Godhead. The scripture is also very plain that we're being changed to the image of Jesus. That when he appears, we're going to be like him. So we, I want to be really close when he gets here. I want him to be shocked that not much has to be done to me when he comes back. That's our goal, is to be changed to the image of God's Son. So this word conformed, he says, stop. Stop the direction you're going. Quit being conformed in your mind and your character to another pattern. You have a pattern. It's laid out for you in the Word of God. Quit being conformed to another pattern. You have a pattern uh, in front of you to shape you to look like Jesus. Be transformed. Most of the young people in here know about transformers. They look like one thing with a little bit of change. They look, they're something else. They might be a robot and then they change into an airplane or they might be a robot and then the, the toy changes into a car. He's asking us to be transform, transformed and that word means metamorphosed like the butterfly. Be changed where you look like something totally different. Be morphed, one of the versions says. Be changed, be metamorphosed, and be morphed by the renewing of your mind. How am I going to change? How am I going to change? I need to change. Oh my goodness, I need to change. How am I going to change? I'm going to change. I'm going to change my eating. You ever tried to change things by the flesh? Did we talk about that already? Change things by sheer willpower. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. We are changed by the renewing of our mind. That's how we're changed. That's the way God set it up. The sooner we learn that, the, the quicker we can change. Vines, concordance, says that the present continuous sense or present continuous tenses indicate that this is a process. We are being transformed. We are being, 
I think sometimes we get impatient with ourselves, so we quit in the changing because we have setbacks, disappointments, or maybe even out-and-out -out failures, but we only fail if we quit. And he's asking us to be transformed, and Vine says this indicates a process. That's what we're doing tonight, and that's what we do here, actually, every service. It takes diligent, focused energy to change. We, we've just been way too casual with it, and it's just more than listening to something while you're driving. That's important. That's seeding things. We've got to do something with, with what we're hearing. In, in her book, Dr. Leaf talks quite a bit about how our culture today glorifies multitasking. And that we were really designed to focus. And when you read the scripture, you realize that. And so, you know, I think sometimes we, we feel like we have this badge if we're good at multitasking. When it comes to the word and changing our thinking, we need to have some focused energy. We need to have some intentional thinking, which is what we're talking about tonight. There's something fascinating that she covers. She talks about literally the science of the brain, how in the daytime you're, you're building, you're building thoughts, you're forming thoughts, and how at nighttime, nighttime is when your mind sorts or ponders, or we might call it meditates. You know, you, you think of, intentionally think of things during the day, you intentionally do things in the day, you intentionally plan things during the day, and then at nighttime, your mind processes all of that. Anybody ever had trouble going to sleep because your mind was processing everything that you thought during the day? What if we did that right? What if we put the word in and built our thoughts during the day, intentional thinking, so that at night when our mind begins to sort and to process, we're actually doing something good? It's a biblical principle. Psalm 63, 6. Psalm 63, 6. I'm reading it to you out of the New Living Translation. Short. I'll give you time to turn there, though. Psalm 63, 6. It says, I lie awake thinking of you, and I meditate on you through the night. I bet... If you form thoughts tonight during this service and you think on them intentionally on your way home while you're getting ready for bed, that you'll meditate on him when you go to sleep. It's a God principle. You might look up all the things that talk about meditating on him or remembering him in the night watches. Night watches is one of the words that I looked up. I lie awake thinking of you and then I meditate on you through the night. Holy Spirit... I give you my mind tonight. Well, that's going to be great if you've been intentionally thinking. Meditation is not a bad word. I know the world took a God principle and tried their best to mess it up. I mean, you just say the word yoga and Christians freak out. Okay? I don't necessarily use the word yoga, but I do love the word meditate. And I love the word meditate because Scripture's full of it. Absolutely a God principle that the world took and used it for other benefits, or what they would consider benefits. We can't give up meditation because the world made it an ugly word to Christianity. It's ours. We owned it first. Meditation is a great, great Word. It's a God principle. It's actually intentional thinking. It's exactly what it is. It's deep thinking. When you look it up, it means deep thinking, pondering. It means muttering. You know, you, you, Arkansas, you mull it over. You mull it over in your mind, in your, is that a Hector word, Mr. Hector? Any word, okay. Mulling it over. You take that God principle that you need to establish in your heart, that you want engrafted into your life, and you think on it intentionally. 
You, you meditate it. You ponder it. You think it. You mull it over. You mutter it. One of the versions says mutter it. That just means you talk about it to yourself. And I talk about it to myself out loud. The out loud words have power. They really influence our heart. So it's not bad. We can't... This is one of the things God said to me in my nap. My... 30-minute nap today. We can't afford to deep think our problems and shallow think the word. We cannot afford to deep think our problems and shallow think the word. I think a lot of times we meditate our problems. He's asked us to meditate his word. Don't mull over and mutter and talk about and ponder and... You know, when you're going to sleep, your problems, or when you're awake either, but especially right before you go to bed, because that's what your imagination's going to go to while you're asleep. But think on the Word. We can't afford to deep think our problems and shallow think the Word. I can't just listen to the Word and not give it, give it my thought. Direct my thoughts on it. I think we, we've been guilty of that. Go with me to Psalm 1. Man, I've got more pages of notes. I'm going to be long-winded tonight. I'll try to keep it. Try to keep it good. May have to carry over into next week. Psalm 1, verse 1. I'm reading out of the Amplified. Because I love these adjectives. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, not following their advice, their plans, and their purposes. Not, not giving thought to their ways, their plans, their purposes, okay? But giving it to God. Nor stand submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk. We can't be passive. We, we've, we've got to be active. Nor sits down to relax and to rest where they're scornful and the mockers gather. But his delight, the blessed man, his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord. Or I'm going to say in the word of God. And on his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates. He habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night. That's intentional thinking. That's the blessed man. Or what, what was that definition of blessed? Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable. He habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night. Well, all I've got time to do is listen to it in my car. That's great. Listen to it in your car. But at some point, stop and think on it. Don't just let it go through your ears. It's got to stop in here. And we've got to stop and think on it. Study it. Look up words. Think about words. He will be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. It's worth meditating. You've got to go to Joshua 1.8. Dad, we're thinking of you. <laughs> it's my dad's favorite scripture, Joshua 1.8. The key to success. Are you there? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? that thou mayest observe to do it. The whole point of meditating the Word is so that we will observe to do it, so that it will change the way we're living and what we're doing. You don't let it depart out of your mouth. That means you, that's, this is what you say. But you meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Meditating the Word. That's, that's what's going to change how we are and bring us success. 
We need to grow beyond listening. You know, yeah, we, started, we all started off listening to the Word. But we need to grow beyond listening and meditate the Word, purposefully thinking on it and thinking on Him, especially in our quiet time. Well, I don't have any quiet time. Yes, we do. I was listening to Rick Renner, and uh, he said, you know, people say they don't have any quiet time. He said, do you ever go to the bathroom? Now, I realize moms, sometimes even going to the bathroom is not a quiet time. I, I get it. We can find a quiet time if it's driving in your car. Don't meditate too thickly if you're driving in your car. But we can find some, ty- some quiet time. If it's at, on break at work, go to your car if you can go to your car. Find quiet time to let, well, let me, let me just give you a great Carolyn Leaf quote. Ready? Our minds need time to understand what our spirits already know. Our mind needs time to understand what our spirits already know. Got it? Or you need one more? One more? Our minds need time to understand what our spirits already know. That happens when you're meditating. How much time am I giving my mind? Maybe I should say, what to what am I giving my mind? Because my mind doesn't shut down. So what have I said it? What have I directed it to meditate on? This is fascinating to me, you nurses, and I got several nurses in here. So this is interesting to me. Dr. Leaf said this. She said, new nerve cells have been born while you're sleeping. New possibilities, fresh, new nerve cells have been born while you're sleeping. They're at your disposal. And we can wake up and think the same old way. Or we can use those new possibilities that were born in us overnight. And she beautifully tied it into Lamentations 3, 22 through 26. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I love that. She tied that into the cells that are born in us overnight as our bodies rebuild themselves, literally cell by cell, and our brains have fresh possibilities. We wake up with new mercies every morning from God, new possibilities. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to dedicate those new brain cells to what we already had in us that we don't like? Are we going to put them to work building the life that God intended us to have? I think you're going to think about this when you wake up in the morning. I think this thought is going to come back to you in the morning. His mercies are new every morning. I have have the ability to think something today that I didn't think yesterday. That needs to be his word, but that's still a powerful concept. Mm, do I want to get into 2 Corinthians 10? How long have I been, Tom? I got 15 minutes. I can do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's not in my notes, so I'll have to... Part of it is, but I didn't get the scripture typed out. This was a, just in case I have time, and oh my goodness... I don't know if you can see all the notes on 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but we may not get through in 15 minutes just by what I have in my Bible. Man, I was listening to Bill Johnson on the war in your mind, the war in your head. I got some good stuff out of this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence... And base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. 
But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I've said this several times, but we tend to try to fight things from the flesh. We can't change our thoughts from the flesh. Your spirit man knows truth. When it hears truth, your spirit man wants to apply. He wants you to apply that truth. He wants to apply that truth and change the way you've been thinking. We don't war after the flesh. We, we war after the spirit. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds. That's arguments. One version says it's reasonings. Bill Johnson on, on his teaching says these strongholds are thought patterns, ways of thinking that we've established in ourselves either um, by words that we've heard or by experiences that we've had. We've, we've made things the way they are in our head. And they've become strongholds. This is the way it is. This is the way life is. This is the way work is. This is the way marriage is. This is the way being a woman is. This is the way. And we've built these strongholds that may not be true in our heads. And he said they war against God's Word. Now when you think of it that way, that when we're thinking wrong, it is warring against God's plans for us. The way God sees us, that will really put us to looking in the mirror of the Word and seeing where, where we have strongholds. I'm looking to see if I got all my stronghold notes. Casting down. Whew. Casting down. That means destroy. To destroy by force. Imaginations. You know what imaginations are? Meditating on the wrong thing. So you pull down, you destroy, you annihilate imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself, that comes against, that wars against what God said is truth. We are supposed to cast that down, to destroy that thought, to get rid of it completely. And bring into captivity... Bring it under the control of Christ. You could say the word. Bring every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me see what I wrote over here on the side. Mm. Bill Johnson said this. Strongholds. Strongholds are areas that the enemy can hide in and rest and wait to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That wrong thought gives the enemy a place to hide, and it gives him a place to attack from. That ought to make us want to get rid of it. There can be good strongholds, and when we have good strongholds, that's areas we can rest in because we've established right thinking in it, and that's our goal tonight. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I'm telling you, this word can get rid of wrong thinking. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We let the word take that thought captive and lead it away. That's our goal. Bill Johnson's question. Why is your reasoning at war with my world? Whew. Why are you arguing with the word? Well, I can't be prosperous, blah, 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 blah. I have a limited income. I live off of Social Security. Why, why are you reasoning against my 
word? Why are you letting your thoughts war against what I have planned for you and the way I see you? That is so powerful to me. His word is the truth. His word has a plan for us, and, and we have to bring anything that rises up against that captive. We'll end with Proverbs 4. I'm going to read it to you because you're so familiar with this verse. Proverbs 4, 23. I'm going to read it to you out of the complete Jewish Bible. We talked about it a while ago. Above all else, guard. That guard's going to be the word. Your spirit man, armed with the word of God, is going to be that guard that guards your heart. For it is the source of life's consequences. The mind matters. It matters. This whole book is written to us so that we can change our mind to line up with the Word. Got enough to think about tonight? Me too. <laughs> Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.